everybody is vulnerable to it. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are, you are vulnerable to your environment. We're really seeing the signs of warming loud and clear in the data. Our science has shown that pollution can vary from block to block by up to 800%. What's really going to probably be happening to the redwood trees is a thinning forest, a more flammable forest. I think climate change has its fingerprints all over these types of fires. There are a lot of issues when we think about sea level rise. Failing to address these issues now is only going to make it more expensive and more difficult. Thanks for joining us for this NBC Bay Area special, Climate in Crisis. It's been a year in which most of our journalistic work pointed toward the pandemic or the election or racial inequality, but we are not overlooking the health of our planet. We just lived through the second warmest year on record. We're feeling it and seeing it firsthand. Our summers are hotter and drier. Our wildfires growing bigger and sparking more often. It's literally turning the skies around us orange. When we pointed our journalists and meteorologists toward the problem of climate change, we didn't know exactly what they would come back with and how surprising it would be for many of us. Our Earth is changing. Summers growing hotter, winters more unpredictable. Simply not enough rain and too many fires. It's no longer a question of whether climate change is coming because as we're witnessing in the Bay Area, it's already here. So we're really seeing the signs of warming loud and clear in the data. Consider the data from this Berkeley weather station that's operated since the 1800s. It used to record an average of five days a year over 85 degrees. But in the last decade, it's averaged 15 days a year over 85. In some years, it's more than 30 days. Scientists say without action, we will see temperatures rise 10 degrees on average by the end of this century. And we'll see a shrinking of the rain season in California, something we've already seen in recent years. Our fire season knows no bounds, wildfires even in January. That's because our warming planet is leading to shorter rainy seasons, drier vegetation, and blistering winds. We actually have fewer fires than we did a few decades ago, but they burn five times as much land. The wildfire season that's in this year has really brought the reality of climate change home. Climate change has reduced our summer fog by 35%, impacting the health of our iconic redwoods in West Marin. And that's all linked to climatic change. In the next 30 years, sea levels are expected to rise one to two feet, and as many as seven feet by the end of the century. In West Oakland, homes, a wastewater treatment plant, and even the new eastern span of the Bay Bridge are vulnerable. So there are a number of low points that would be flooded, in some cases permanently flooded, with even just three feet of, of rise. There are a lot of issues, I think, when we think about sea level rise, and it really requires a lot of different groups to come together. Scientists say we are at a sobering point in our history where immediate action to curb our impact on the environment won't necessarily make things better, but rather will stop them from getting worse. So now what? Do we just sit back and brace for the worst, or can we actually do something, something immediate and something realistic? We're going to look at a lot of things tonight, so let's just start at the top. The first thing we did, we sent our weather team out to where climate change is touching the Bay Area. They met with scientists to check out what's going on firsthand. Our chief meteorologist, Jeff Ranieri, found evidence of warming right in our own backyard, of course, at a weather station in Berkeley. And Jeff, this weather station, the data is revealing, right, because it goes back 100 years. Yeah, it's a really great read on how things have been going here in the Bay Area for over a century. And, you know, our main goal here was really to set out across the Bay Area uh, to take a look at where that climate change is happening right now. And I have to say it was somewhat easy to find. Now, uh, I started out in Berkeley and Take a look at this. It really doesn't look like much, but this is actually the weather station that's been recording that data for over a century. And it's the new data we're getting from this that is certainly quite alarming, especially for a city like Berkeley that's so environmentally conscious. Here's a look at what we uncovered. Tell us about this weather station here and some of the data you've been looking at. 
So the weather station has been at this location since uh, the late 1800s, uh, around 1880 or so. And so it provides an important long-term record of the climate in this region. Here on the land, we're seeing impacts on crop yields from higher temperatures. Uh, we're certainly seeing impacts on ecosystems, so drier vegetation has been a big driver of increasing wildfires in the western U.S. This weather station used to only have about five days per year on average that were above 85 degrees, but for the last decade, that's been about 15 days on average. And some years we've had 30 days, an entire month above 85 degrees. And so we're really seeing the signs of warming loud and clear in the data. What are some things people can do? As a planet as a whole, we can take collective action to reduce our emissions, both through you know, building up more clean energy, like solar panels or wind turbines, changing our behaviors in ways that can reduce our emissions, you know, buying electric cars instead of internal combustion engine cars, eating less red meat. And at the same time, this is such a big problem, it's not going to be solved by all of us voluntarily going vegan or whatever. It requires policy, it requires legislation, it requires governments to take action. In this area is that temperatures have warmed about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit since the late 1800s, with most of that warming happening over the last 50 years. It's a lot more warming than we've seen for the world as a whole. The world as a whole has only warmed about two degrees during that period. We have a choice of how much future warming we have. At the low end, if we take a lot of action to cut our emissions quickly, we might only have two degrees more warming here by the end of the century, so five and a half total. If we don't, if we keep emitting you know, at the rate we were, we could end up with about seven degrees warming, so 10 degrees total by the end of the century at this location. Climate change is just starting to get to the point where it's recognizably bad for a lot of people. But if we don't do anything to slow it down, it, it will get a lot, lot worse. Um, and so, you know, it's really in our hands. Eye-opening data, Berkeley warming faster than the global average. And it's that warming that really starts to set off so many other problems for us in the Bay Area, like our oceans warming and rising, our summers getting longer and drier. We also uncover the fog that feeds our redwoods. That's also slowly starting to disappear. And check out this map, at least 10 spots where climate change is touching the Bay Area right now. In the Delta, out in Discovery Bay, toxic algae blooms that are growing and poisoning our water. In Palo Alto, we walked along a struggling creek where salmon used to swim. And in the Santa Cruz Mountains in the CZU fire zone, the new ways that fires are behaving and the dangerous ways they're also spawning fire natos. Coming up in just a few minutes, you'll hear from my fellow meteorologists, Carrie Hall and Rob Maeda, about what they found when they investigated climate change. Raj? Jeff, thank you. Everything you just talked about is creating another big problem, our seemingly endless fire season. How about this for a solution? Just leave the state. I know it's pretty drastic, but it is happening. There's a growing community of so-called climate refugees. It's a thing. Here's NBC Bay Area's Anusha Rasta. When we say the word refugee, many of us think of war, political conflict, violence. But there is another kind of crisis that experts say will create millions of refugees for decades. And a lot of them will be from places like California. Everybody is vulnerable to it. Um, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, um, you are vulnerable to your environment. Stanford emergency medicine doctor Paul Auerbach studies climate change and its impact on human health. He says the climate crisis is causing life-threatening problems like the wildfires in California or the storms in Texas and forcing people to pick up and move their entire life somewhere else, making them climate refugees. So we're terrified of, you know, we didn't ever want to go through that again. So we didn't want to live around with trees around us. Ann Martin and her boyfriend ditched California for Tucson, Arizona, right after she says their house in paradise burned down in the campfire. Ann explains that the cost of living also made it hard to live here, but the fire and the fear that it could happen again next time forced them to finally move. I don't want to lose what little I have left, you know. I've already lost my most precious possessions. 
are gone. Dr. Auerbach says that it is estimated that more than 25 million people worldwide are forced to leave their communities every year because of weather events like wildfires, hurricanes, floods, and droughts. He says he's seen some estimates as high as 800 million people becoming climate refugees by the year 2050. He doesn't believe there's a single perfect place to live, but argues everybody from civilians and politicians to massive companies and foreign governments need to do their part to stop burning fossil fuels, sending toxins into the atmosphere, and warming the planet. Personally, I think uh, it, the most important thing is to um, live where you think you can be part of a community that's going to face this head on and try and mitigate it to the extent of preparation. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but it's not impossible. Um, we won't get there in a hurry, but we can get there. Experts agree that climate change will make many parts of the world uninhabitable and even more quickly if we don't take steps to curb climate change. Dr. Auerbach predicts there will be many more stories like Ann Martin's, who had no choice but to leave the only place she's ever known as home when her life was in danger. And there were houses on fire around me, and I thought I was going to die, so I called my kids and I said goodbye to my kids. Fascinating. There are a lot of people like Ann Martin. She actually did it. There are a lot of people who are considering it. And it's not just the remote areas here. There are dozens of cities and communities in these fire zones. And it's really, there's no signs of our fire danger getting any better. In fact, it's getting worse. Anusha Rasta is with us now. Really interesting story, Anusha. I've been talking about this with my friends and family. How did you find Ann? How did you track her down? Well, I found Anne on Facebook along with a lot of other people. You just mentioned that many people are either considering this or they're doing what Anne did. I found her on Facebook. There were many people who reached out to me on Twitter. Now, not everyone wanted to be interviewed for television, but that doesn't mean they didn't have the same experience. So clearly, this is a problem that doesn't just affect people in underdeveloped countries. It's happening right here in sunny California. It's amazing. She went out to... Scientists have been warning us, and you may have even noticed it yourself, sea levels are rising. And around here, we're surrounded by ocean, bay, and delta. Our coastal areas are more prone to flooding, shoreline erosion, and hazards from storms. Now, a big portion of the Bay Area faces west, and that's a trouble spot. Places like Stinson Beach and Ocean Beach. In fact, Marin County says it's that within 79 years, Stinson Beach could rise by up to 10 feet. The county is now starting a project that will protect its coastal communities before disaster strikes. What about OB, Ocean Beach? Meteorologist Carrie Hall has more on the water that's threatening San Francisco. Here at Ocean Beach, like much of the California coastline, we are already seeing huge impacts from climate change. Well, we're here to talk about what sea level rise is going to mean for Bay Area communities. We have quite a bit of development along both the coast and then inside the bay, and, and it's vulnerable to sea level rise. It's vulnerable to both flooding, uh, but also from erosion, from the action of wave, and as water levels rise, then, then cliffs are, are vulnerable as well. Here in, at Ocean Beach and in many places, we have constructed seawalls to fight erosion. There's two main causes. Um, one is, is the thermal expansion of seawater. So as seawater gets warmer, it expands. And so it increases the area and that, that pushes seas up. Um, but in addition to, to that, land ice is melting because of warmer temperatures. And that land ice then also runs off the land and, and contributes, ends up into the oceans. Looking back at the 20th century, so over that 100-year period, sea levels rose by about 8 inches. By mid-century, we're looking at about a foot to two feet of sea level rise. This is a very significant increase in the rate of rise. We have to begin preparing for that now. 
waiting to do that is only going to put more infrastructure, more people at risk, and raise the cost of, of doing it. Our next topic are iconic redwood trees. Majestic, beautiful, and so important to our environment. But the redwoods could be in trouble. Our weathercaster VNA Arana spoke with UC Berkeley plant biologist Todd Dawson. He says Bay Area fog is a crucial resource for our redwoods. The fog gives nutrients to the trees through its roots and leaves, but our famous fog is disappearing. Take a look here. In 1950, the Bay Area was experiencing about 12 hours of fog a day. Now we have nine hours a day. That's a 30% drop in our daily fog coverage. Todd Dawson says that fog or lack of it is directly linked to climate change, and it's a bad sign for our redwoods. Let's bring in Professor Dawson now. Uh, Todd, thanks for joining us uh, here on this program. Break it down for us now. Why is the fog decreasing? Remember, in layman's terms here, so we can understand. Okay, yeah, well, the fog is decreasing because the earth is warming, the ocean is warming, and those two elements lead to conditions that do not favor fog formation out on the Pacific Ocean. That has to happen for that fog to come inland and have an impact on the redwoods. So global warming is at the heart of it. And Professor, is this something linked to global warming, or is this kind of just a cyclical thing that happens throughout the history of time? No, there, there are cycles. There definitely are times when fog in, in the past history has been higher or lower. But currently, as you said right at the beginning, the decrease in the hours of fog per day are really linked to the warming of the earth that we've experienced in the last 50, 60, 70 years. That's incredible. Can you give us a, a timeline, Professor, what's going to happen with our redwoods, specifically just here in the Bay Area, if nothing changes, if we continue on this course if we stay on the course that we're on now uh, I fear to say that the redwood range will contract very likely that the southern end of the redwoods down near the Big Sur area will eventually go away and there'll be a much smaller range over which the redwoods can grow along the coast of California is this 20 years 30 years 60 years down the line you know, I think we're going to we're already seeing the signs of it today, but I suspect that we won't see a massive contraction for probably 50 years or more. But we are losing trees on the edges of the range and particularly at the southern end of the range. Professor, thank you for your time and your insight on this matter. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Happy to help. So what can we do to combat climate change now? The professor says it starts at the grassroots level. We've probably heard that before, but it really works. One way is taking alternate ways of transportation. Don't drive your car everywhere. Use your bike or public transportation. Now, VNA. Okay, here's a quick list. We brush our teeth, we use plastic silverware when we dine out, or we get our bills, some of us still do, delivered via snail mail. There's so much of what we all do each day that feeds into this slow breakdown of our planet. We have life hacks, so what about climate hacks? Our weathercaster, VNA Arana, shows us some small changes that we can all make right now to help the environment. Check it out. As much as I like cooking, I love ordering out, which is great for our local restaurants. But it's got me noticing how many plastic forks and spoons I'm constantly throwing out. Now, I need silverware to eat when I'm on the go, so it's got me thinking about looking for a better option. Here's the problem. Forbes says an estimated 40 billion plastic utensils are trashed in the U.S. every year. They can't be recycled because they're too contaminated with extra food. And even if they could, they're too small and too lightweight for the recycling sorter. So those 40 billion plastic forks, spoons, and knives will sit in the dump for 1,000 years while they break down. Hey, VNA, it's time for your climate hack. I have awesome friends that are really good about carrying their own silverware. They often come in little baggies, kind of like this one, which means I can still eat at my favorite local restaurant, but instead of the plastic, I'll carry these around in a bag or in my purse. Also, when you're ordering online, whether it be through an app or on the site's website, make sure to look for the option to forego the plastic silverware altogether and use these instead. So what's the payoff? Carrying reusable silverware can make a big impact right now and in the long run. If every American didn't use any plastic cutlery for just one day, we'd keep 100 million pieces of plastic silverware out of our dumps. That's a lot of plastic. 
That's a, that is a lot of plastic. All right, in the newsroom here, we say, hey, v &A, <laughs> we got you out of the living room and here in studio with us. Uh, okay, so here we go, v &A. Uh, This was a unique story assignment. How'd you go about this? One of my first thoughts, Raj, was when I was younger, I would hear reduce, reuse, recycle, which is fantastic, but I started doing a little digging. And now as an adult, when you hear the words climate change, it can be a little overwhelming about, well, what can I do to make a difference? That's when we came up with climate hacks. And these are simple planet from swaps for everyday items that you have right around your home without having to overthink it. I just saw on the John Oliver program, he was just talking about this, the dangers of plastics. And now we talk about eating. We're all doing a lot of eating out, at least take out those plastic forks. Can it really make a difference? It's not going to save our planet, but obviously it's going to make a difference. Right. When you think about one, you're like, well, that's not that many. However, we crunched some numbers and did the math. Let's say, for example, one plastic bottle of shampoo, which is a big offender to our planet, right? If everybody living in the city of San Jose, for example, which has a population of over a million switched out to refillable shampoo bottles or bars of shampoo. Well, that's about 12 a year for one person. That could keep more than 12 million plastic shampoo bottles at a landfill every year. All right, that's when we make an impact. And this is good. This is a two way dialogue. You're giving us some hacks here, uh, but people are also giving you some climate hacks. What are you seeing from everyone? Viewers have been awesome. Some of them already implement, you know, eco friendly ideas and swaps around their home, which is what we like to hear. But then there's also people. People now who maybe didn't think about it and are now curious about it. And these are some of the tweets that I've been getting from our viewers. For example, somebody tweeted us, I love the idea of carrying around my own utensils and I love the climate series information. I hope people are listening and taking the steps to make changes. Another person wrote, I liked your advice this morning about hair ties. I'll be looking for some biodegradable ones today. And this is exactly what we want to see. We want to give viewers the information and then hopefully they'll apply it, you know, get a little curious about it, do their own research. And hey, if you guys have some some ideas at home, feel free to send them my way. I'm going to send them your way as well. I can <laughs> yes. tell you right now, yes, but I'm, I'm going to reach out to you on, on social media. Thanks. I'll be waiting. <laughs> Thanks for your day. All right, you can check out our climate hack segments every Saturday and Sunday mornings on our morning program, Today in the Bay, or VNA's social platforms. Her handle is what we're talking about at NBC VNA Arana. We've also posted them all on our website. We're making it easy for you at NBCBayArea.com slash climate hacks. Climate change has its fingerprints all over these types of fires. And that, scientists say, is turning our landscape into a dangerous tinderbox. There's no place in the country, really, that's more visible than here in California. Our fire season is longer, it's stronger, it's more explosive, and sadly, it is deadlier. From summer to early fall, fire season has really taken over our way of life for many communities. Let's rewind here. This is what we've lived through in the last few years. The Wine Country Fire in 2017, the Camp Fire up near Chico 2018, Kincaid Fire 2019, then last summer, remember that collection of fires ignited by that rare lightning storm with the SCU complex down the CZU complex. It was all over. We were surrounded here. Is this our new normal? Meteorologist Rob Mayetta spoke to one climate scientist about the frequency and the frightening way our wildfires are evolving. Behind me, you see the Woodward Fire burn scar in Marin County at the Point Reyes National Seashore. One of many several major fires that burned in a record setting fire season across the Bay Area in California in an era of a warmer climate and shortened rain seasons, which is having the impact of extending our fire season by up to 75 days. We had that record year for wildfires last year. What comes to mind when you think of the 2020 fire season? What's happening in California is that we're having that warm, dry weather that makes fires more likely and more severe. This historical trend in increasing wildfire can in part be attributed to climate change. We're seeing that fire season extend much further into the fall and even starting earlier in the spring. We're seeing that if we do nothing, we're already in trouble. I think we already have unacceptable fire risk and it seems to just be growing. As climate is warming and the fire season is lengthening, we're just having more and more days when the slightest mistake can cause a catastrophic fire. I think we're already in an unacceptable zone, and you would especially think that if you're in any of the communities that have burned out, but 
climate change is going to make that worse and worse, where the season in which those hard to control fires happen gets longer and longer. Over the last decade, we've had something like 30% less rain on average. So you have warmer, drier conditions. That leads to both more flammable fuel, sort of in the short term, but it's also leading to problems in forest health. We've had fire suppression in the state for so long, and we're also having fire weather and sort of severe fire risk at times a year we didn't used to. So we're kind of facing growing and growing fire risk right now, and so we need to do more management. And we can do that through prescribed burns. So let's take areas that haven't burned in a long time and help them burn when we know the conditions are right, the fire won't be catastrophic. When we model the effect, of changing climate, what's predicted for climate change on wildfire severity, we've predicted a doubling in the number of catastrophic fires by the end of this century if we don't mitigate climate change. Rob Manda joins us now. A lot to digest. Your job has even evolved here. We've worked yeah. together for, gosh, more than 10 years now. It's something where it's not just, okay, here's the sunshine, here's the rain. Now it's really, here's our fire danger, which is seemingly year-round. Yeah, more months tracking fire danger than incoming winter storm systems, and that's something Margaret Torn, Dr. Torn talked about. Fire season is becoming longer, and fires burning a lot more acres, growing more rapidly, and those larger fires obviously having big air quality impacts as well. But what we're noticing about our wildfires is that they're changing. They're getting more intense. They're generating more extreme fire behavior, and at times actually changing the weather within them. Give an example here, this column plume fire associated with the car fire generated a fire tornado as that hot air rises and the air rushes in on all sides and begins to rotate. That caused EF3 level wind damage of 143 miles per hour with air temperatures of about 2,700 degrees. Now as our climate continues to dry and our droughts become more common and temperatures continue to rise, hotter temperatures associated with wildfires growing more rapidly could mean that California's severe weather has really become wildfire weather. What was the stat we were just talking about in the commercial break there in terms of last year we had six fires, five of those six were record breaking? Yes, that's, that's true. You have the top 20 wildfires in terms of acres burned just last year. Five of the top six all in 2020 were the five of the six largest. Now, if you go back to 2000, 85% of the state's largest fires have occurred in just the last 20 years. And twice in the last three years, we've set new state records for total acres burned. So a lot of times we say climate change isn't just one year. In this case, it's something that happens over decades. The last 20 years have taught us that story in California that this is becoming more common. You think a lot of people are seriously considering, not think, I know a lot of people are seriously considering where they live because now every August, September, they're thinking, okay, we're either going to get the PG&E shutoffs or we might be evacuated voluntarily even. Yeah, it's a new reality. The wildland urban interface is a lot of communities have been built up away from larger cities into these rural areas that are natural fire zones. So that's kind of the new reality due to climate change we're seeing around the state. Uh, good information. Thanks, Rob. Well, so what's the federal government doing here to help California? President Biden, you might have heard now, is pushing that new infrastructure bill, a $2 trillion plan, and it's very broad version of what infrastructure is. Vice President Kamala Harris was back home recently hoping to convince the American public to support this historic plan. She stopped by an East Bay mud water plant with Governor Newsom you see there. President Biden's bill would divert billions of dollars to improve the nation's water quality, especially for low-income communities. The vice president also visited a black-owned business in West Oakland called the Red Door Catering Company. It was there that she granted us an exclusive interview. Most of us, me included, I think of infrastructure, bridges, mm -hmm. roads, water pipes. How do you sell this now? Not just to the American people, but to Congress. How do you sell $2 trillion with tax hikes, and it's going to be this thing called human infrastructure, green technology? Let's talk about water. So as a daughter of California, right, we all know, we've experienced, we've lived through drought. We know the significance of water as a precious commodity, something we cannot take for granted. Anyone anywhere knows the importance of clean drinking water. We know the importance of the need to collect water in terms of capturing rainwater, storage of water, right? Yeah. That's all about jobs, what we need to do to create the infrastructure around water. Clean water, drinking water, lead pipes, 
We've still got communities all over the country with, just filled with lead pipes, you know, in terms of there, there's too many because there shouldn't be any because that's about lead, which is toxic, Can impacting our children. So what exactly is in this plan? The White House says it will rebuild 20,000 miles of roads across the country, repair the 10 most economically important bridges in the U.S. That includes, or could include, we should say, the Bay Bridge. Like the vice president said, eliminate lead from pipes in water supplies and accelerate the fight against climate change by shifting to new, cleaner energy sources. So this is pretty broad in what it's talking about. Now, one thing the Bay Area has a lot of and what we love about the Bay Area, right through the Golden Gate Bridge, once you get in that Golden Gate Bridge, there's a whole new world. And over the years, businesses from gas stations to refineries to shipyards have opened and closed along our coastline. And many have left behind toxic waste. Scientists tell us their big worry is what's going to happen when rising waters flood these toxic waste sites? They're worried about 1,100 locations. Here's the Bay Area. You see all those orange dots there? All of these orange dots are active or retired industrial sites that could leak pollutants as the water starts washing over them. One of them is called the Selby Slag. Here's the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. And up here, near the Carquinez Bridge, the Selby Slag. It's owned by the state and an oil company. NBC Bay Area Jody Hernandez shows us that despite meetings, proposals, and promises, cleanup isn't even close to starting. Lots of buildings in one of the largest smokestacks in the world. Don Zampa spent a lot of time as a kid on the shores of the Carquinez Straits. His great-grandfather came from Italy to work in the former smelting plant called Selby Works. As young kids, we enjoyed watching the big gondola cars move the you know, molten metal down into the piles, which would be piled way over here, and then they would pour it out and it would splash like, uh, like you would see uh, lava flow in Hawaii. We'd play on it, play Army or what have you on the cooler sides of the slag pile. Millions and millions of little bits of you know, cubes of slag. Little did he know the piles of slag left behind when the plant closed were toxic. After extracting precious metals for nearly a century, the company abruptly shut down operations in 1971, tearing down the plant and the company housing and leaving behind the toxic waste or what's called slag. In the 1980s, the Selby slag landed on the list of state Superfund sites, which put the Department of Toxic Substances in charge of cleaning it up. Then 12 years later, it was paved over with concrete, which environmentalists call a Band-Aid fix that's now failing. Recently, Baykeeper investigated Selby Slag shoreline and found that the shoreline is actively eroding into the bay. That means that huge amounts of toxic contaminants are falling into the bay. The San Francisco Baykeeper has been monitoring the situation. It points to this state data that shows the slag was already leaking in 2006. The yellow markers mean the waters near the slag tested positive for levels of lead, mercury, and nickel at concentrations guaranteed to be harmful to any living thing. And scientists say climate change will make matters worse, turning this into an environmental catastrophe. Now, with sea level rise concerns, uh, Baykeeper is very concerned that the level of toxic leaching from the site is actually going to increase pretty significantly over the next few decades. The Department of Toxic Substances Control has been discussing a new fix now for years. They say their draft plan calls for dredging and excavating the slag from the bay, then placing a new asphalt cover on it and finally installing a seawall to keep the tides from coming into contact with it. They say the earliest that cleanup would start, 2024. Just trying to put a seawall around this is, so, is really laughable. It's kind of a ridiculous proposal and a ridiculous solution. Baykeeper says toxins need to be removed from the site altogether, and the cleanup needs to happen right away. You're not really going to eliminate the toxins unless you excavate them and remove them from the site entirely. From where I'm standing, you can see why the baykeeper is so concerned. The water is splashing up against the shoreline, eating away at the asphalt cap, and the water is only going to rise. Well, the site is closed to the public. Folks who live nearby say it's a big worry. 
Some are descendants of smelting plant workers. My great great grandfather came over from Italy to work in the smelting plant. Everyone who lives in the area wants to feel safe. I love it down here, and I'd, I'd like for it to, to be a, a safe environment to raise a, a family for sure. For the kids who grow up here, I'm very worried. That's really dangerous, so dangerous, because a lot of people still fish out here. A lot of people. You can go up and down the straits and see people fishing. And they, we know they eat the fish. Environmentalists say it's not just the immediate neighborhood at risk, but the entire region. They say cleaning up the Selby slag can't be put on hold any longer. In Contra Costa County, Jody Hernandez, NBC Bay Area News. Joining us now, Sajel Choksi Chu. Sajel was just featured in Jody's story. Sajel, nice to have you with us. Um, let me just start by saying, are, are we crying wolf here, or how immediate is this need to clean up this site? It's pretty urgent to clean up the site. We've got a site that's been contaminated for a number of decades now, and the pollution that could come off the site with sea level rise and the projections being what they are is a really big concern to Baykeeper. Who's in charge of this problem, uh, and, and what are they doing about it? Or is it kind of a committee of people? Yeah, so it's a site that's been left over. Um, the, the responsible polluters are gone from the site now. So the Department of Toxic Substance Control is the agency that's responsible for cleaning up the site and figuring out how to deal with it. And unfortunately, their plan so far has been contain the pollution in place and cap it. But that's not going to be a, a good solution for sea level rise and what, what's projected to happen in the bay. And Sajel, it's interesting, not just this program today, but also just as we've learned so much, you obviously know a lot more than we do, but most of us are just learning about all these things that we kind of covered up and now they're being exposed. Some probably some smart people made some decisions they thought were smart at the time. Do they, do they know now that these were perhaps the wrong solutions that, that they tried? Certainly, you know, back when they were making these decisions, I don't think anybody really predicted sea level rise being such a big issue and a big problem. But over the last five to 10 years, that's become really clear that sea level rise is happening and the bay is going to be impacted. So we need to now stop thinking about short term solutions and start looking at long term fixes for how to deal with this problem. Okay, and that, of course, comes with uh, with money. We just chatted with Vice President Kamala Harris, who was in the bay area a few days ago and her task right now at least one of them is trying to pass help lobby the country here for president biden to pass that two trillion dollar infrastructure bill and with that comes money for projects in theory projects like yours if that two trillion dollar bill passes uh, are you raising your hand are you busting down the door to get some of that money we will definitely be screaming and shouting for part of the funds to come to san francisco bay to help protect the shoreline Okay, most of us have done it, tossed out our leftovers. It's a habit that environmentalists say is destroying the planet. Every year, we waste 30 to 40 percent of our food supply. 30 to 40 percent. That's according to scientists at the Breakthrough Institute, which is a research center in Oakland focused on climate issues. Most of the food that's wasted is wasted at home. It also happens, though, on farms, grocery stores, and restaurants. No matter where it happens, that food ends up in landfills and rots and sends methane gas into the air. The food wasted from the United States is equivalent to how much greenhouse gases are produced by 37 million cars. Wow, so how can we all waste less food? Turns out we can do it with the touch of a button. NBC Bay Area's Chris Kamura is gonna show us how. How many times have you found something in the back of the fridge that was once edible, but is now a science project? Too often. The Natural Resources Defense Council says as much as 40% of food is never eaten. It's wasted. And wasted food is wasted money. The USDA pegs a cost-conscious family of four's grocery bill at $924. Well, if 40% of it goes in the trash, that family's wasting $370 per month. So let's look at how to waste less food and money using your smartphone. In the app, you can create lists for your freezer, fridge, and pantry. That's Kasper Jortspal, a computer science student in Denmark. He developed a free smartphone app called No Waste. It helps you do a food inventory. Think of yourself as a CPA for your kitchen. 
a real bean counter. Here's how it works. You use the app to scan the barcode on every bottle, bag, and box you have. The app then keeps a running food inventory for you. That should eliminate guesswork while you're grocery shopping and prevent you from overbuying stuff. So basically, you will always know what food you have at home, how much you have at home. Casper says 11,000 people are using the app, and their food waste drops to just 4%. For that hypothetical family of four we discussed earlier, that's a possible savings of $330 a month. So what about privacy? We asked. Casper assured us he's not selling any user data. If you're still skeptical, it's okay. He told us you can sign into the No Waste app with a pseudonym. It's obvious our changing climate is triggering a lot of problems. We talk problems, but what about solutions, especially in the Silicon Valley? We sent our business and tech reporters out with a single mission here. Find out what Silicon Valley and Bay Area companies are doing to fight climate change. Let's bring in Scott Budman. You've been doing this not just for a couple of years, for a couple of decades now. Is it a PR move to jump on this, uh, not bandwagon, but is it a PR move, or is it something that they really want to be in it to? I think it's something they're really wanting to fight, and they're Therefore, throw a lot of money at Raj, and that's how we know Silicon Valley wants to get involved. We didn't have to look very hard to find companies adopting practices and money aimed at stopping global warming. And not just big tech companies worth billions, but also small family owned businesses. Let's start with what we wear. This is a trillion dollar industry. The fight against what's called fast fashion means convincing us to buy less clothing, to use what we have longer, and then recycle. San Francisco's Stitch Fix uses technology to help you pick just the right clothes so you need and buy less. Now, when we go home, building a house, it's not just loud, it's bad for the environment. So Mighty Buildings uses 3D printing to create materials for the houses they build. All made in an Oakland warehouse, these materials and the whole process are better for the environment and they create less waste. We're already starting to see the first homes created via 3D printing. Finally, you know about electric cars. Soon, some of them will power your house. Lucid Motors, a Bay Area EV maker, is working on technology that will allow battery-powered cars to, while they sit in your garage, send electricity to your home to keep the lights on. Right? Okay, great ideas, great concepts. It takes money. We talk about this so much. We love that term. Is it scalable? Where's the money coming from and how much? Yeah, I mean, I've been covering Silicon Valley a long time, and the amount of money going towards this shows me that it is serious. After all, what does Silicon Valley do when faced with the problem? It spends a lot of money to fight and fix that problem, and that's what's going on here. Individuals, donors, Sand Hill Road, where are you talking about here? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of investment from venture capitalists up on Sand Hill Road. They're putting a lot of money and effort and innovation into fighting climate change. I recently called a few VC firms to find out about their green funds that you can invest in. Nine got back to me that day. It's a small community and they're all competing with each other. Are we late in the game? Are we fourth quarter here, or are we just at the beginning of all this? You know, the experts would say we have to fight now, that it is late, that it is really important, but I think whether it's Bill Gates writing a book or the owner of a store down the street, everybody knows this is serious. It's time to put money and innovation at the problem, and we really see a lot of that happening here. Good information. Thank you, Scott. So what's next for Earth? Well, that's a deep question. It's a question, though, a Bay Area artist is asking with her new project that warns people about the dangers of climate change. NBC Bay Area's Joe Rosada Jr. shows us how she's doing it. I'm going to edit this way. Art often takes its cues from nature. And for artist Michelle Guillere, I'm going to add this piece. Nature also supplies the materials. Okay, so this looks good. The Sunnyvale by Way of France artist finds inspiration in the environment. Though sometimes in her art, beauty is not always pretty. You can see the piece of, of trash here, and it's all collected um, around the bay. This is good. If there's a common thread in her work, it's raising awareness about the threat of climate change. Climate change is, is linked to education, is linked to the finance aspect of our society, is linked to everything. And in the pandemic, Guerre sees a wake-up call. One little virus can jeopardize the balance of everything. 
To help raise awareness about the threat of the climate crisis, Guillermo started the What's Next for Earth project on Instagram. She invited artists from around the world to post art reflecting the state of the world and a path for the future. It, it could be uh, paintings, uh, photos, uh, digital collages. Among the contributions, a photograph by Marcela Villasenor showing a boy bicycling in Brazil through what was once a rainforest. At least we can try to show to some um, audience what we were thinking and maybe that will help a little bit. Gear's project was adopted by Stanford's Millennial Alliance for Humanity in the Biosphere, which raises awareness about the human impact on the Earth. This is the essence of the project, is to make people want to know more. Guillermo believes the key to survival isn't just recycling and renewable energy. But maybe to consume less. To her, the best advice on the road forward should come from nature itself. Joe Rosado Jr. Nature gives us everything. NBC Bay Area News. A lot of passion right there. If you want to learn more about how you can make a difference and combat climate change, Head over to our website, nbcbayarea.com slash climate in crisis. You can check out all the Bay Area hotspots. And we are not stopping. We will continue our in-depth reporting. I'm Raj Mathai. And for everyone here at NBC Bay Area, thanks for joining us.